Well, good morning and, and thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. Uh, as Annie said, my name is Caroline Chappell and I'm a research director at Analysis Mason, responsible for our cloud and platform services practice. This practice is the home of our edge computing research uh, and I also work closely with my 5G and IoT colleagues as we track Industry 4.0 opportunities for operators that involve all three technologies. I'm sorry you can't see me, but I'm having some broadband issues today, so it's probably safer to, to keep my video turned off. Uh, we certainly agree with uh, Thierry Sender, who's the Director of IoT and Real-Time Enterprise Product Strategy at Verizon. When he said on a recent webinar that we're at a point of tremendous innovation and disruption with 5G and IoT and Edge. That's true, but what I'd like to point out to you today is that these three technologies are not quite uh, of, um, converging yet. And sorry, I'm going to need to put this, I think, in, um, in, in slideshow mode. That's better, isn't it? So, um, so, so uh, IoT is the most established of the, uh, of the three technologies. 5G, of course, has yet to fully mature and be deployed. But it's the edge computing market that's happening now and how it plays out and who dominates the value chain may well determine what happens to what I'm calling industrial 5G to differentiate it from consumer mobile broadband 5G. At the moment, as I hope to demonstrate, there's a very large uh, market opportunity for edge computing, but it's a fragmented one. So it can be difficult to know which sectors and use cases to pursue. It's also a market in which public cloud providers are taking an interest far more quickly than we originally expected. And given how central enterprises say the public cloud providers are to their digital transformation strategies, they're likely to become formidable competitors. So 5G, Edge and IoT are seen as key enablers of digital transformation. And digital transformation is of course needed to deliver industry 4.0. The quotes on this slide are from two different manufacturing companies we've, uh, we've spoken to uh, in, the, in the past, but we've also spoken to dozens of others across different industry sectors who say very similar things. 5G, of course, promises this homogenous, seamless and ubiquitous connectivity environment that can serve everything from in-building use cases to wide area ones with more flexibility and at a lower cost than fixed networks and with superior robustness, range, throughput, and latency to non-cellular alternatives. But the challenge for 5G is that most industrial environments are brownfield sites, as I think the previous speaker was pointing out. They already have a plethora of networking technologies connecting existing IoT devices and driving current industrial automation use cases. We believe it will take some time for 5G to displace these technologies, especially when you consider that the life of a factory, for example, can be up to 20 years. And our enterprise market survey suggests that companies don't yet see that 5G is as critical as IoT or edge computing to their digital transformation strategies. That said, we can certainly see a growing market for private cellular networks as enterprises, particularly in the manufacturing, energy, mining and logistics sectors, start to deploy them to support early Industry 4.0 use cases. The drivers for private cellular networks include data security and privacy, the desire to keep data within the industrial campus and buildings, and the flexibility and cost that mobility delivers for the future versus cabling. Although I can't release our numbers today, we are in the process of building our private 5G network forecast, which should be published soon, so, so watch out for that. Now, there are very few use cases as yet that demand private 5G networks rather than LTE. But one of the advantages of 5G network functions is, that, of course, that they're designed to run in the cloud. They're being built from the ground up in a cloud native way and the 5G core can scale more easily than the virtual EPC for industrial environments. This development is coinciding with the distribution of cloud environments to the edge and innovations in cloud automation that will potentially make 5G functions, despite their complexity, lower cost to deploy and operate than previous network technologies. 
Of course, the cloud automation that, del that can deliver this benefits, these benefits need to be built, but that involves an understanding of modern software. A number of new entrants and challenger vendors we see are emerging in the 5G market, and they combine cellular experience with DevOps skill sets and knowledge of the cloud. And these companies are targeting their network functions at the Industry 4.0 opportunity and delivering private cellular networks to enterprise customers as a fully managed cloud-based service. Uh, service. But that, so they're not the only category of vendor competing with operators for enterprise 5G customers though. Microsoft is the first public cloud provider to buy a 5G core vendor, Affirm Networks, to strengthen its edge and IoT proposition to enterprises, but it may not be the last. Systems integrators tell us that their ability to provide a tailored service to enterprise customers based on specific industry knowledge and integration skills is winning them business over operators. And I think, again, the last speaker made the very a good point that you do need that very industry specific and use case specific knowledge uh, in, in order to, to win in this market. The established network equipment providers are becoming particularly active in the private cellular network market, both going direct to enterprises and through operators as resellers. So operators will have their work cut out providing 5G networks for industry 4.0 use cases as simply and cost effectively as enterprises need and in a way that competitively differentiates them from all the other players in this uh, increasingly crowded market. Now, while 5G may take some time to bed down in an industry context, not least because some of the industrial IoT demands on the standard are slated for release 17, which may be delayed due to meeting difficulties during the COVID-19 pandemic, industrial demand for edge computing is gathering pace. On the basis of the extensive enterprise market surveys we've carried out both last year and this year, we do see a very exciting level of interest in edge computing and to our surprise, solid plans to invest in it. Now, as you can see from this slide, which is based on a survey of 207 large enterprise respondents uh, across four advanced economies, uh, UK, US, Germany, and Japan, uh, in six vertical sectors. The delta between the top and bottom driver for edge computing is very small, suggesting that enterprises are highly motivated to adopt it. Edge is seen as an enabler of a completely new level of customer experience, whether that's by helping with the proactive management of products through servitization or enabling new ways of interacting with customers. It's also associated with the ability to keep data close and, even if this is a matter of perception rather than fact, more secure than shipping it to a central cloud hundreds or thousands of miles away. And interestingly, Edge is seen as supporting the deployment of new systems, such as distributed digital thread systems, providing new levels of visibility into and, and comparisons between operations in different sites, which may all use different IT and OT systems for historical reasons. As a corollary, the barriers to Edge computing are seen as low. This slide from, an enterprise, from the same enterprise survey we carried out last year shows that enterprises certainly believe they can make a business case for edge, but the largest barrier is the current lack of off-the-shelf solutions with which to make such a case. For example, we spoke to, uh, and that, this is actually very recently, we spoke to the technical director of a large multinational insurance company who pointed out that many of the edge use cases they're envision, uh, envisioning are quite futuristic and haven't been developed yet. They involve completely reimagining the customer experience with highly naturalistic low latency voice and computer vision, which will give the company a great opportunity to gain competitive advantage, not least through real-time decision making. But the solutions they, they need don't exist yet. In fact, we've found that there's no shortage of edge computing use cases that enterprises can imagine, or ideate as the jargon goes. Many of these use cases have an IoT dimension, and it's clear how they'll be enhanced by 5G in future. As I said, we've conducted surveys in both 2019 and 2020 of these over 200 enterprises across six verticals. And on this slide, you can see the top use cases the respondents said they wanted to have delivered on a public edge cloud. 
by a public edge cloud, I mean a multi-tenanted edge cloud that is hosted by a third party provider, such as an operator, in a location external to the enterprise premises. Just for comparison, we define a private edge cloud as one that runs on premise. Now, the striking thing about these edge use cases is that they're completely new. They are not the established IT workloads that enterprises want to run on the public cloud. Edge use cases can be massively data intensive. They're often associated with real-time control scenarios. They can require handover from location to location. They can be highly sensitive to latency and jitter, and enterprises want to execute them in close proximity to their premises. All these are very different requirements from applications running in the public cloud today. So I note the question um, to the earlier speaker about the primacy of the central cloud, the economics of the central cloud, but there are plenty of use cases out there um, that we're hearing about and that enterprises want to execute where the central cloud is just not an option. So I mentioned natural language processing, for example, even the latency between data centers in Belfast and Dublin uh, can make a difference to what you can do with natural language processing, as the insurance company was pointing out. The problem is that these use cases vary significantly from vertical to vertical. There is no single, single killer enterprise app for, uh, for Edge Cloud. So there is an onus on players in the edge computing value chain to understand the very different needs of each vertical. And as the uh, previous, uh, and that's exactly what the previous speaker said, you know, you need to understand the context, uh, the, the, the industry context, where edge is really going to make a difference. So if operators wish to provide a public edge cloud for industry 4.0 applications, they'll need to work with solution partners with industry sector knowledge or acquire it themselves. And these solutions partners will want their solutions to run on as wide an edge cloud footprint as possible one that actually extends across operators in order to serve the, the broadest possible enterprise market. Verizon has actually been one of the most open operators in terms of explaining its edge cloud strategy, which it's developing in conjunction with AWS's wavelength edge technology stack, that's a public cloud technology stack on premise. On this slide are the key use cases that Thierry Sender said the company's developing some of which have already been commercially deployed and others are in a proof of concept stage. At present, these use cases run in Verizon's Chicago Edge data center, but the operator plans to launch wavelengths in other major US cities, uh, co-located with its 5G infrastructure before the end of this year. The Verizon wavelength sites will appear to AWS developers as discrete availability zones to which they can deploy their applications and any Verizon 4G or 5G device can be used to access those applications. Now, many of Verizon's use cases have a real-time decisioning element. Shelf inventory automation involves real-time computer vision, for example, while assisted pick and pack uses cameras to validate orders against the ERP system, which is updated in real time. The predictive maintenance use case enables manufacturers to take critical actions based on real-time data. An immersive video collaboration brings specialists together to view the same documentation at the same time. And Verizon points out, uh, as indeed um, have other um, uh, enterprises we've, 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 we've talked to, that actually this video collaboration, um, immersive video collaboration has really uh, got a tremendous boost uh, by, uh, by, by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Now, pre-COVID-19, we estimated that the global market for public edge cloud, that's this multi-tenanted uh, third-party provided cloud off-premise, uh, that, the, that the global market for those services would reach nearly um, US $34 billion by uh, 2025. And this slide shows our splits by industry sector and region. Uh, this figure includes edge cloud related co-location services, in which we include both location and data center infrastructure rental, cloud infrastructure as a service revenues, platform as a service revenues, application as a service or SaaS revenue, and business integration services. But it does uh, exclude edge connectivity revenues. In fact, we see very little need to revise this figure in the light of the pandemic. 
slowdown in investment by sectors that are badly affected by COVID-19, like automotive, are being countered by rising demand for edge computing in sectors like packaging, life sciences and healthcare. We recently talked to a major uh, healthcare provider, for example, that said that edge computing and 5G were nowhere on its, on its roadmap um, last year, uh, but have suddenly become really important because, of course, with workers at home unable to access massive data sets and massive data sets that they need, for example, around um, you know, patient images, um, MRI scans, or indeed to even run the, uh, the healthcare provider's network itself, they need to look at millions of logs um, and DNS, uh, 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 DNS logs a day, and they just can't get access from home to, to, to all the data. Um, so, so edge um, uh, being able to put some edge computing uh, nodes in, nearer to their um, uh, to, to the staff is, is becoming a, a, a big uh, talking point within the organisation. We'll actually be providing a forecast, a similar forecast for private edge cloud in due course, because as I say, the, these figures only reflect public edge cloud. But we do estimate that the portion of this public edge cloud market accessible to operators is around um, 6 billion US dollars in 2025, with revenues derived mainly from colo services uh, that realize the value of operators' real estate and from infrastructure as a service. We believe it will be difficult for most operators to tap into the higher value platform services and application revenue streams. Although according to other research we've done, a very high proportion of operators themselves want to do so. Around 70% of operators, for example, say they want to provide edge PaaS and SaaS services to enterprise customers, compared to around 20% who want to monetize edge real estate. The challenge is, as I've said, that such higher value PaaS and SaaS services need to be delivered in an operator and an edge agnostic way. Developers are not going to develop the same application multiple times for different operator edge cloud platforms. Many of you will remember that it was a similar expectation that ultimately sunk operators' mobile app walled gardens and allowed the likes of Twilio, Apple and Android to rise. So if operators are to provide an edge native development platform and a marketplace of edge applications, they'll need to do so in partnership with others. And of course, one of the ways operators are getting around the requirement for a global platform to attract developers is by making alliances with public cloud providers as Verizon has done with AWS. It's the public cloud providers with their established development platforms and huge developer ecosystems that hold power over applications in the market today. And over the past year, AWS, Azure, IBM, et al. have shown a remarkable appetite for edge cloud computing. This slide summarizes the public announcements of partnerships between public cloud providers and operators over the past year. And you can see that the largest operators, including Verizon, are clearly hedging their bets and working with uh, more than one public cloud provider in a divide and conquer strategy. And longer term, operators still harbour ambitions of providing a global operator-led public edge cloud platform, one that is more aligned with the MEC vision of being able to run both IT applications and cloud-native 5G functions. At the moment, public cloud provider clouds are co-located with operators' telco clouds, as Wavelength is with Verizon's network cloud. Although longer term, it's AWS, Azure, et cetera's ambition to take over network functions too. Now, operators' goal of creating a telco-specific edge cloud that can challenge the public cloud providers is, is a worthy one, but there is a question mark over whether they can achieve it. Such a cloud needs collaboration on a global scale, and the number of fragmented operator initiatives out in the market at the moment is a concern. This slide depicts two such initiatives, but there are a variety of others, including, of course, Etsy MEC and the Linux Foundation Edge, in which different groups of operators are involved. So as long as operators are more wary of competing with each other than they are of competing with the public cloud providers, it looks likely that the latter will dominate the edge cloud market and potentially 5G for, for industry 4.0 market as well. After all, as I pointed out at the beginning of this presentation, 5G standalone cores and VRAN functions are already being deployed to public cloud infrastructure. 
So in conclusion, given the wide range of uh, possible cloud, edge cloud use cases, operators have a challenge to pick the best ones to monetize. Our recommendation is that operators should choose verticals in which they already have strong relationships and look for use cases with a close affinity for 5G. They'll need to be realistic about the role they can play in the emerging industry 4.0 value chain, recognizing that it's all about end-to-end -end solutions. Enterprises are interested in use cases and business outcomes, not an edge cloud or a 5G technology cell. And finally, if they're not to conceive most of the value in the industry 4.0 market to the public cloud providers and their application partners, operators will need a concerted collaborative effort to build a global telco edge cloud. And they can start by supporting an initiative that, that appears to have the most traction behind it. So thank you very much for listening. And um, I don't know, Annie, if we have uh, any, any questions or that's it. Uh, yes, we, yes, we have. And um, I don't know. It's, um, I don't know. It's almost kaleidoscopic, isn't it, this market? There are so many moving parts, I feel. So the question uh, we have is that um, edge computing offers a plethora of benefits to driving new age solutions such as IoT, M to M and RPA, as well as being critical to help 5G networks reach their full potential, I think. Um, however, edge networks can also cause serious 5G headaches, largely because of the massive amount of devices on the network that are collecting data. What do you see as some of the key security concerns that need to be addressed if edge computing is to be viewed as a safe alternative to the cloud? I'm sorry, that was a very long question. Yes, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, again, talking to in enterprises, um, one, of the, one of the interesting ways that they want to use uh, 5G networks is in a very much a zero trust uh, way. Um, they don't believe in, um, the, 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 and, and this is talking to some very, very advanced enterprises. So Fortune 100 enterprises. Uh, Fortune 100 enterprises no longer have um, uh, IT departments. Uh, you probably know this uh, from your digital transformation uh, research, but, but they tend to have digital factories or um, uh, they've, they've spun out software companies that work in these very agile DevOps ways. Um, and so they're very, very forward thinking and they think in, 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 in very different ways. It's, it's not like traditional IT at all. They're all working uh, with, um, in, 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 in a serverless mode of application development. So, of course, they're well ahead. Uh, they, they, they're, they're well ahead in understanding cloud native software development. Um, and they can see 5G coming up as a cloud native uh, technology. So, what they, uh, and, and the idea of working in, in serverless is that it's very event driven. Everything's ephemeral, um, everything's only fired up when you want to use it. And they want the 5G network to be like that. They, they don't want persistent nailed up VPNs. They want to be able to, to um, do application driven, okay, now I want to send some data. I'm going to do it in a zero trust way. I want to do it in an ephemeral way because that's really difficult to hack. Um, and, and this is the way they're thinking about things. So I think there's got to be a sea change. There's got to be a, 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 a really, real understanding of what these enterprise customers want out of 5G. And as I say, the, the companies that understand that um, are thinking in that direction tend to be at the moment the public cloud providers because they get it. Um, and, and, they, um, and of course, you know, you've seen Microsoft buy affirmed. I mean, it's, it's, going, in that, it's going to go in that direction. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a very interesting uh, difference. I think the, the whole idea of the corporate network is changing. Um, they, they realize that they've got to work in a, in a zero trust um, uh, environment, persistent VPNs, you know, nailing up endpoints um, is actually really difficult. And I think this was something the previous speaker was, was alluding to. So it's a very different way of thinking that, that cloud native is going to enable if, if done properly. 
So, Caroline, briefly, I'm sorry to say, because we're running a little bit behind the bus, um, we have um, another question. You and I have talked about this in the past quite a bit. And it is, do you see um, the market converging towards competition or collaboration between telcos and public cloud providers as the dust settles in a few years? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. We, we did a survey of operators and the, um, the mood for collaboration came out as a lot stronger in, um, in, the, U, in the US and in Asia-Pac, well, North America and Asia-Pac, than it did in Europe. There's a lot more suspicion about the public cloud providers um, in, um, in, in Europe uh, from, from the operators. So, so different parts of the world have different views on this, um, and I, I, I think the um, I think it's inevitable that I think collaboration is inevitable because it's it's very much down to the developers, and it will be down to developers uh, for for, um, for 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 edge uh, for edge native computing, as as uh, as I think people are starting to call it. And I think, but I do think you know there is a there is an opportunity for operators to do something, particularly around five G. Um, and building some kind of, of operator cloud. They've, they've tried in the past. Let's see whether they, they managed to do it this time around. Mm. Okay, and um, really quickly, finally, um, who will own the customer relationship, the OTT or the telco provider? I don't. I don't think that's a given that the OTT will, will necessarily do that. I think there are a lot of a lot of players here. As I've pointed out, you know, there are the um, there's, there's definitely systems integrators that we have to, 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 to look out for here. And systems integrators could be extremely big in this market. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think um, the network equipment vendors are also, uh, some of them, um, like, like uh, are doing some really impressive things as well. So, so I think it's, uh, it's a very fragmented market at the moment. Um, let's, let's wait and see longer term. We'll, we'll, we'll be keeping tracking this, Annie. Good. Interesting stuff, Caroline. Thank you very much indeed. Really, um, I think your presentation went down really very well. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you for inviting me. Good luck. Pleasure.